Well, um, it is now eight o'clock. We're going to we're going to get started now, and um, this will uh, this session will complete right at eight thirty. So we're on a tight timeline today with lots of material to color cover. So with that being said, um, before we start today, I am going to ask, um, and it won't play out perfectly in the Zoom world, but I am going to ask that each of us take a minute to pause for a moment in silence around you know the the conflict that we have um, occurring in Europe right now. And um, so we can just all spend 30 seconds to reflect on that. So I ask for your patience and offering 30 seconds of silence on behalf of, you know, the conflict in Europe. Thank you. So <clears throat> it's been nearly a year since we had our last um, all district Zoom. And quite frankly, I think I miss them a little bit, but um, in honor of respecting your time this year and all the hard work that each of you are doing on a daily basis, um, I don't wanna take any more of your time than absolutely necessary. As we've seen some developments over the last couple of weeks, I feel it's really important today to come out so that you understand where we're headed and the why um, with regards to mask and then what other mitigation strategies may be looking like as we move uh, or transition through the spring. So um, this is exciting. This is an exciting time for many of you and um, I'm happy for you. Um, this is also a time where some, you know, and this includes staff and students and families where, you know, there may be some anxiety. And so my hope is that I can um, reassure you um, today um, with regards to where we're headed and why, and we will absolutely do this safely. Um, I, I, I think, um, I know that our school system has um, led the initiative to return to school led the initiative to return to school safely, um, led the initiative to support staff and students in a way that um, allows for that to happen safely. That hasn't changed. Um, that is exactly our primary focus. We are 100% committed to in-person learning and we are 100% committed to staff and student safety. Um, I wanna take you on just a little bit of a, a, a walk here. Um, and, and I think it's good, you know, I want to spend maybe four minutes talking about where we've been. If you remember March of 2020, um, on that day, and I believe it was the 17th, if I remember right, or 19th, um, you know, we were closed. Uh, it seemed like, you know, overnight it happened on a Friday and that next Monday, um, we were scheduled to be in school. Um, and we ended up canceling that day. And then we were remote, remote for the remainder of the year. We came together as an organization on that weekend. Um, you know, we had no idea it was coming. We had no idea what to do. And, you know, we, we brought in about 60 individuals, um, leaders from across the district and union leaders. And we sat in a room on a Saturday and a Sunday, which that very rarely happens in public education, especially a Sunday, where we sat in that room and we, you know, started with glassy eyes, like what in the world are we going to do? Um, and then we put our heads together and we came up with some creative solutions for the spring of 2020. Then we um, invested hundreds of hours over the summer, that summer, to talk about our reopening plan, talk about our planning, talk about what it's going to take, you know, to, to reopen. And again, cooperative and collaborative efforts led us to a model that successfully brought back our students in the fall of 2020, unlike many districts across the state of Washington. Uh, we started with our SPED students about mid-September of 2020, um, and we brought in our kindergartners on October 5th, and we continued to transition until we finally, um, at the end of the first semester, beginning of the second semester, we finally um, were able to bring back our secondary students. And we've been in school ever since. Um, and there are very few school districts that can um, say that, and we can, and we've done all of that safely. But I want to take us back to um, fall of 2020 when we brought back our SPED students and we brought back our kindergartners. 
there was a lot of fear and anxiety in our system. We didn't know if we could do it. And I'll be honest today, I wouldn't have been honest that back then around like I was a little bit nervous. Can we take on this virus that is unseen and be able to navigate school systems and do it safely? Well, you know, as well as I know, we did it and we did it very well. And so I'm gonna liken now the back end of this pandemic. And I, I don't know if that's the technical term right now, um, but I'm gonna just state it in, in, for my purpose today. As we start ramping down some, um, some mitigation strategies, um, that same fear and anxiety may be um, set in, in some of our minds. But I take you back to the fall of 2020, you had those fears and we successfully navigated it and did it successfully. We're gonna do that again. Um, we're committed to that. We're committed to working with you, with you, um, with, with each, of, you know, each of you individually and as, um, as an organization and with our uh, local health officials um, to make sure that we, we navigate this in a very safe manner. And I'm gonna view this as, and I'm not meaning to be disrespectful to anybody in this room, but this is a celebration. If you think back to March of 2020, you know, this is the day we were yearning for when we can start really getting serious about reducing the mitigation strategies within our school system. But we're gonna do that in a very um, intentional uh, manner. And, and that's really the purpose of, of today's meeting. So, um, Carmen, can you, can you put that slide up from Dr. Moss's um, presentation? And I want to outline that just real, where are we at now? I saw this presentation and this is uh, Dr. Moss and I think I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She, it works for the State Department of Health. She's a behavioral therapist. And, and this is the, I first saw this in January of, this, of, of 2021. And it started to make some sense to me. So right here um, around, actually you can't see my cursor, but where it says outbreak um, and impact, um, you know, uh, that, that was um, the beginning stages of COVID in our, in our state. You know, so um, there were a lot of heroic actions right out of the gate because we're really in kind of a honeymoon state. Um, and then, you know, the, the realization after we get into month three and then six and then nine and then 12, we get into, um, you know, a, a disaster mindset. And I had never heard this prior to January of 2021, you know, calling COVID a disaster. Typically you think of, um, you know, things like, um, you know, earthquakes or, or um, you know, large storms, et cetera, as a disaster. But you know, in the mind, you know, this this is this is a disaster, and it did separate us and remove us from what we saw as normal life. And so, the mindset and the mental health, quite frankly, of all of us, um, regressed over you know the next twelve months. But then, within any disaster, there starts to be a recovery. And that recovery, you can see, started to occur in this disaster scenario in months 12 to 15. And you remember last year about this time, how, how each of us felt when a vaccination was going to be executed um, for educators across the state of Washington and across the nation. And, you know, quite frankly, anybody and people, you know, could get a vaccination. So there began to be hope. And so we started to, to, to gear up towards a slow recovery back to where we were pre-pandemic. Then all of a sudden, you know, uh, between the months 15 and 18, a Delta hit, and we had that drop again. Um, and so you can see that line takes us down to actually, because of how our minds work and minds operate, you know, it, it takes us to a lower point around, we weren't even fully recovered from the first COVID you know, experience that we had. And now all of a sudden we were faced with the daunting task of Delta. Um, and so it takes us into even a more mental mindset or a more um, fragile mindset, I'm sorry. 
So what this slide doesn't account for is then Omicron. And this is an older slide. I couldn't find the newer slide, but you have the same downward trend, you know, happening as Omicron hit and actually took us to a lower point than we were at the previous two. So, um, you know, that's where a lot of our society and our community and our people are, you know, functioning from is we're just starting to, 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 to learn to recover from, you know, not one, not two, but three very um, significant events in all of our lives. So, okay, you can, um, you can uh, drop that, Carmen. So now, so now that leads us to um, today. Um, and, you know, as you all know, the, uh, the governor came out and indicated that uh, the mask um, mandate would become optional. Initially, he said March uh, 21st. And, um, you know, then Monday, and I wasn't aware of a meeting on Monday, and I know I don't know that many people were. Um, Monday, the governor came out on March seventh, or excuse me, uh, and indicated that uh, he would move that up for school systems um, a week. Um, so that 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 takes us to the March fourteenth date. So uh, we are, and I want to make sure this is very clearly stated: we will be transitioning to a mask optional um, position that um, will be implemented on Tuesday because we don't we have a snow makeup day on, on March 14th. So I don't anticipate a snow day between now and then. We will be transitioning to a mask optional uh, um, position on Tuesday, March 15th. And I want to assure, and, and, and so, I, my wife and I have very different opinions on a mask. My wife, I believe on March 15th, will go out to our fire pit and burn all of her mask. And that will be her celebration. And I'm sure there are many of you just like her. For me, um, you know, I'm going to continue to, to um, wear my mask in you know, certain locations um, because quite frankly, it's made me feel more comfortable and I haven't been sick you know, since uh, I started wearing the mask in 2020. And so it gives me a, a level of, of comfort and security when I'm shopping at Costco or when I'm, you know, at Walmart, you know, I anticipate continuing to do so. And that's where we're transitioning as a society. And I'm not trying to be political here at all, but Governor Inslee did say something on Monday that resonated with me. We're moving away from um, government mandates and now, you know, turn the ad over to you and me to make our own personal decisions on how we want to navigate the COVID experience. And I, I call it an experience. It's probably not the correct technical term, but um, it, it, we now have the tools and the know-how to safely navigate moving, you know, uh, forward. On March 15th, when we come back to school after a long weekend, I want to assure you this, the only thing that will change on that day will be mask optionals. Mask, mask will be optional. Everything else that we're currently doing from ventilation systems to um, cleaning, to testing, to you know, providing mask for those that choose to wear it, high quality mask, um, we will continue to do that. Now, there is going to be some Department of Health guidance that's going to come out by March 7th that might have um, some changes to the mitigation strategies that will be implemented in our, in our state. They may be, I haven't seen them, I haven't heard about them, but they may be less restrictive, i.e. physical, di I don't know this, but physical distancing might look different, may, may be more normal um, pre-COVID. Um, and if it is, we're not going to execute that on the 15th. We're going we're gonna to maintain our commitment to the systems that we know work. And, you know, even though that is a challenge in each of our schools around lunches and recesses and everything else, we're not going to change that on March 15th. The only thing that will change in all of the, the things that we're currently doing 
to account for the mitigation strategies that we know work in our school system will be mask optional. So as we move from government mandating, you know, uh, we have to do this to now I or you can navigate through the system how you see fit as an individual. These are the things that you can do. And these are the things that we can do to make sure that you and your students all have a safe experience within our school system. One, I continue to, and, and I know I'm gonna take some, some heat and some emails about this, but number one, it is very clear from our Department of Health that clear to me, maybe not to you, but clear to me based on the Department of Health guidance that getting vaccinated and being boosted is your number one defense against COVID. It, it reduces you know, your experience or your potential of going to the hospital. Um, it reduces the likelihood that you would die from your COVID experience. So you know, that's, that's something that is a personal choice by all of us, but that continues to be something that you will get to choose. You know, do I get vaccinated? Do I get boosted? But that's something you can do to protect yourself. What else you can do to protect yourself if you see fit is wear a mask. Um, like I said, I'm going to keep wearing my mask. My wife's not. And I'm going to respect her for that. And I expect everybody in this organization, from staff to student, to respect each other's personal choice. If you have a peer, if you have a student, if you know that 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 is wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, of, you know, opposite of your your um, position, I expect all of us to respect that. When you're wearing a mask, the type of mask matters, and we've known this for several months. You know, um, a two ply cloth mask provides some layer of coverage, but you know, it's more about people around you and protecting people around you. If you trade up and wear a surgical mask, what quite frankly, we've been wearing for our instructional staff since the beginning of the pandemic and or a KN95 or an N95, you're not only protecting others around you, protecting yourself, we know that. And so the quality of mask matters. And so if, if, if you, you continue to have concern about those around you, maybe not masking, think about your mask. And, um, you know, that's, that's what, I, what I want each of you to do. So the two things you can do as an individual, protect yourself if, if you're concerned um, of COVID exposure, get vaccinated, be boosted. Number two, the quality of mask. The things that we're gonna do in our school system will be one, physical distancing will not um, change. If the Department of Health guidance comes out on March 7th and says, hey, it goes away, on March 15th, that will, it will look no different in our schools. We will assess the, what March looks like and determine what changes we can make after spring break. That's what we'll do. Number two, we will continue to um, maximize the ventilation in all of our schools. That comes at a cost. We're paying $200,000 in additional heating and cooling. It's primarily heating uh, fees to do that. Our dampers are open at 100%. You at the high school and the middle school, you're running those radiators that are, uh, they are a pain. I've been in your, cl your classrooms. They're hard to hear. I have trouble hearing over them, but we're going to continue to do that commitment to a high level of ventilation within our schools. We'll continue the cleaning protocols that we established. Um, even though your research is pretty clear, that's not how you're going to pick up this virus. We'll continue to do it because it makes us feel better. And, and we'll, we'll continue to stay focused on that. And we will continue our testing protocol and um, protocols. So um, there are things you can do and there are things we will do. And I can assure you this, on March 15th, the only difference will be mask optional for students and staff. And, um, and, and as we progress through the spring, we'll assess the new state guidance and provided it's not more restrict restrictive, and I don't anticipate that. If it's less restrictive, we'll continue to assess it. We'll work on it you know, as an organization with Dr. Barry and do what's right for Port Angeles. Because as I stated at the beginning of this session, um, you know, the staff and student safety of our organization is priority one. And we have done this successfully from the get-go, and we will end this pandemic 
at, you know, at speaking in, in, in those terms around maximizing staff and student safety. So with that being said, um, Dr. Barry is here with us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barry. I appreciate your attendance. And um, I will turn the, the mic over to you. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, please forgive the fact that I'm calling you from my car. Uh, my daughter's daycare opens at eight. So that's that's the only way that I can be with you at this time. Um, I do uh, appreciate making these interactive, so please do feel free to uh, raise your hand for questions in the chat. Uh, I might uh, deputize Marty to uh, call out questions that he sees because I am on my phone, so it's a little hard for me to see the chat. Um, Marty gave a really good uh, start to this, kind of setting the stage for what's going on. Uh, on March 14th, we will be transitioning away from the mask requirement to, from my department's perspective, a mask recommendation. Uh, we do recommend continuing to mask in indoor settings for a little while longer. The primary driver for that change from requirement to recommendation is really that, you know, the main thing that gives us the, the main thing that gives us the ability to uh, make mandates and the reason we need them is to keep society functioning, to keep the healthcare system functioning, to keep critical infrastructure functioning. Um, and now that we have been through several waves of this and had a uh, highly effective vaccine, as well as unfortunately a lot of infections in the Omicron wave, we have a degree of immunity in society that makes us think that it's unlikely that we will overwhelm our healthcare system again in the near future. So I do think it is reasonable to transition away from requirement to recommendation. I do think the CDC rollout of the masking guidance on Friday uh, threw a lot of confusion into the mix. And so I want to try to help clarify for folks who are not quite sure whether they should wear a mask or not, or whether it's recommended or not. Um, at this point, we do still recommend wearing a mask in an indoor setting. Uh, generally, we would recommend masking until you get to a case rate of less than 100 cases per 100,000. Helping people translate why we make those recommendations. It's all about the probability that someone in a space has COVID. So for instance, in a classroom, say a 25 person classroom right now, the probability that one of your kids has COVID is 20%. Uh, if we get that case rate down to below 100 cases per 100,000, that probability drops to 5%. And so that's why it becomes reasonable to start unmasking in those spaces uh, is because the probability that anyone in there is carrying COVID goes down. The other reason why we follow case rates is because we're really trying to get to the point where we don't see a subsequent surge in infections from removing masking. And so I, while I think it's appropriate to transition away from requirements, I do encourage folks to continue masking a little longer until we get to that lower threshold, because it will decrease the likelihood that we see significant spread in the schools. Um, and I do want to share my gratitude uh, for the way that uh, the your superintendent has handled the pandemic um, and the continued commitment to the other mitigations. When we, when we take away masking, the other mitigations actually become more important, not less. And so particularly ventilation is very, very critical for protecting all members of the staff um, and your students. I do think it is uh, very possible as a staff member to do this safely. You can get vaccinated, you can get boosted, you can wear a high quality mask. The most comfortable high quality masks that you can wear are a KN95 or a KF94. Um, I've heard that some folks uh, have not seen these yet. So I actually brought some examples. This is the KN95, this is the KN95. looks like this one. Um, KF94 looks like this um, and folds out like this. Um, if you find your KN95s are uncomfortable and pulling on your ears, you'll likely tolerate a KF94 better. They both provide upwards of 90% protection against COVID-19. So if you wear one of those, you're vaccinated and boosted, you can be very, very safe in the classroom environment. Uh, our biggest challenge is simply that so many of our children are unvaccinated. And so when we look at these mitigation practices, a lot of what we're looking at is how do we protect our kids? While COVID-19 leads to less severe disease in kids generally, unvaccinated kids are at higher risk. And so that's why it's so, so important that we have all these other mitigation measures in place to improve safety for those kids, especially kids who have underlying health conditions. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. 
So we don't have much time, um, but uh, you know, I'll ask. Um, so when when um, the term recommendation came to you by way of me, Dr. Barry, you had a very eloquent way of outlining that that term. You know, uh -huh. this is not a mandate. There's a recommendation. Can you can you uh, can you share that sure. position again for me? Yes, I'd be happy to. So I think you know because of two years of the pandemic, people have come to sometimes view our public health recommendations as if they are requirements, um, and we do use those terms differently in public health we make recommendations for all kinds of things um, so that you can live a healthier life. We recommend you go for a run sometimes. We recommend you don't smoke. Um, we make lots of recommendations and they don't carry the force of law. Um, and similarly, that's what we're recommending now. So we're giving you these case thresholds so that you can make an informed decision um, because it is confusing out there. There's a mix of guidance, it's very confusing. We wanna help make it as simple and easy to understand as possible, but they are recommendations, they're not required. Yeah. And um, I had a follow up to that and I completely lost it. Um, Carmen, do you have anything? Um... There's a couple of like school specific things, Marty, that are, you know, uh, in, for example, like events. So there's band concerts coming up um, with mask optional. So will the school district um, require guests to wear masks after the 15th? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, no, when we when we transition to mask optional, um, now we're going to do this smartly. We're not going to, you know, I, we're not going to have a um, uh, an assembly at Port Angeles High School with 900 students in the gym, you know, on March 15th. Um, that's not that's not what we're going to do. We're going to maintain our commitment to the protocols that we know work. If we're going to do an assembly, we've been doing them outside. If we're going to do a dance, we've been doing those outside. So we're going to continue that strategy that we know gives us the best ability to um, navigate uh, large events, large scale events like that successfully. But you know, when we have a school event and, and um, patrons come or parents come into that event, they will have the same option that our staff and students have with regards to mask optional. We will not impose anything more restrictive, um, you know, than, um, you know, the, the guidance from the governor and Dr. Barry. Now, the one thing I wanted to follow up with, and this is something Dr. Barry and I have talked about, I, I this system knows, and I have to say it again, like Dr. Barry has been the shining light for this school district because it, because of how we've navigated our, um, our, our school system through the pandemic, Dr. Barry has been a key influence in all of that. She has kept us safe from the get-go. And I asked Dr. Barry early on when the governor was rumored to start talking about removing masks. And Dr. Barry said to me that if, if, um, if she didn't agree with the, the governor's timeline, she would extend the, the mandate locally, which you retain local jurisdiction to do so. Is that still true, Dr. Barry? Yes, I mean, it's hard to do. And so we, we wouldn't do it unless we felt it was really, really necessary. And I think the, I think it is possible that we will be at a safe threshold by by the 12th. It's pushing it. Um, it was it was safer when it was the 21st, but I do think it's reasonable to remove the requirement then. I do encourage folks, as many of us can keep masking between now and between the 15th and the 21st, the safer will be, uh, but it won't be required. Yep. And, and, and I really appreciate Dr. Barry's, you know, saying candidly, because sometimes we get caught up into politics and unfortunately COVID has become political. For me, it's not political. I could care less about the politics of this. I care about the staff and student safety of our system. And Dr. Barry, you know, when she said that to me a couple of weeks ago, if I don't agree with the governor, we'll extend the mandate. So uh, I appreciate that leadership, Dr. Barry, and that's a courageous leadership, um, much appreciated. So um, we have time now for one more question before uh, we sign off. Um, you have so, anything? Um, I'm actually getting some text messages that kids are walking into classrooms right now. So we are at 30. We have a, a lot yeah. of really great questions and um, I'd like to propose, I've made a note of all of them. Um, and if we, when we send out the recording, we will send out answers that, uh, to those that we uh, can answer. Uh, right. And is that okay? Yes. Great. 
All right. So finally, um, thank you, Dr. Barry, for attending our uh, Zoom today. Um, much appreciated. Uh, you know, as we take this next uh, significant step towards maybe getting back to a new normal for our school system. So um, the last thing I want our staff to hear is we're committed to, you know, making this transition safely. Um, and so I encourage you, each of you that if um, you have questions or concerns, please reach out to your building principal, your supervisor, have conversations just as we did when we opened our campuses for students back in the fall of 2020. It was not easy to do. And we had fear, anxiety, and lots of questions, just as we will today. And so I encourage you, if you have questions or concerns, reach out to your supervisor, have those conversations um, to have a broader understanding of where we're going and why. So um, we're behind you. Um, we'll make this work. Um, it is an exciting time, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get through this together. And uh, once again, we'll lead how this can be done successfully as a school system in the state of Washington. Thank you very much. I don't want to take any more of your time. Have a great day and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Bye-bye.